Friday is so much more than the start of a long holiday weekend. It's actually a day that if fully understood and personally experienced, will powerfully impact our past, our present, and our future. First, let's talk about why today is called Good Friday when so many bad things happened to Jesus on this historic day. Things like his betrayal by Judas, 
his arrest and abuse by the Roman soldiers being forsaken and abandoned by his closest friends as they all ran for their lives. Jesus was then put through a series of six illegal and unjust trials, after which his Roman executioners scourged and beat him to within an inch of his life. And finally, they nailed him to a cross. Now, that sounds like anything but a Good Friday for Jesus. But scripture actually says it was a Good Friday for Jesus, and not because of what Jesus experienced and endured. That was absolutely horrific. But because of why he went through it and because of what it accomplished. The writer to the Hebrews says this in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Jesus saw the joy ahead of him. So he endured death on the cross and ignored the disgrace it brought him. What joy, what joy did Jesus see ahead of him on Good Friday that, that made him experience and endure it and, and actually make it a Good Friday for Jesus? Let me, let me answer that question. Jesus saw your changed life and mine. He was disgraced so that we might be graced and he did it all for us. See, on Good Friday, God demonstrated his love for us. So Paul writes in Romans 5, verse 8, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See, sometimes for love to be believed and received, it has to be seen. It has to be demonstrated. Uh, Dr. Maxwell Maltz, he writes about a man that had been seriously burned and disfigured while he was attempting to save his parents from their burning home. He wasn't successful. Both his parents perished in the fire. Now, the man mistakenly interpreted what happened to his parents and himself as God's punishment, that God was mad and angry with him. And the horribly scarred man wouldn't let anyone see him or touch him, including his wife. And that's when his wife made an appointment to see Dr. Maltz, a world-class plastic surgeon. Dr. Maltz told her, don't worry, I can restore his face. And the wife said, well, that wasn't why she came to see him, that, that she doubted her husband would see him anyway. He wouldn't, he wouldn't meet with anyone. And it kind of confused Dr. Maltz. And he asked, well, then, then why did you make an appointment to see me? And she said, I want you to disfigure my face so I can be like him. If I can share his pain, then maybe he'll let me back in his life. Dr. Maltz was shocked. He said no to, to her request. but. But he was so moved by her love that he went to speak to her husband. And knocking on the man's bedroom door, he called loudly, I'm Dr. Maltz, a plastic surgeon. I know I can restore your face. No response. Please come out. Again, there was no answer. And still speaking through the door, Dr. Maltz said, your wife came to see me. She asked me to disfigure her face, to make her face like yours in the hope that you'll let her back into your life. That's how much she loves you. There was a brief moment of silence. And then ever so slowly, the doorknob began to turn. See, Jesus loves you and me so much that he actually was scarred and disfigured for us on the cross. See, the cross declares and demonstrates how much we are loved by God. And if you and I will dare to open our heart's door to him, our face and our future will be transformed. Sovereign with no end, an architect of wonder, and dust you made a man. Speaking light from nothing, the universe aglow, shining just to show me.
on Good Friday, God not only demonstrated his love for us, on Good Friday, God rescued us. See, Good Friday is actually a rescue story, much like Eddie Rickenbacker's. It was October 1942. Eddie Rickenbacker was sent on a mission to deliver a message to General Douglas MacArthur with a hand-picked crew in a B-17 known as the Flying Fortress. They set off across the South Pacific. The crew became lost, ran out of fuel, the plane went down. All eight crew members escaped into life rafts and, and they battled the weather, the water, the sharks, the sun, but most of all, they battled hunger. After eight days, their rations were gone. They ran out of options. It'd take a miracle for them to survive, and a miracle happened. After an afternoon devotional service, the men said a prayer and tried to get some rest. Eddie was dozing with his hat over his eyes when something landed on his head. He would later say that he knew it was a seagull. He didn't know how he knew, he just knew. And that gull meant food if he could catch it. And he did. The flesh was eaten, the intestines were used as fish bait. What was a seagull doing hundreds of miles away from land? Only God knows. But because it showed up, Eddie Rickenbacker and his entire crew were saved. Eddie's story is really our story. It's really the Good Friday story. See, we've all been lost, spiritually lost, not at sea, but in life. And we've all been visited by a sacrificial visitor who, who journeyed from only God knows where to willingly offer himself to rescue us. That's what Paul writes in Galatians 1 verse 4. He writes, Jesus Christ rescued us from this evil world we're in by offering himself as a sacrifice for our sins. God's plan is that we all experience that what? That rescue. See, now every Friday evening, Eddie can be seen walking down a Florida beach to the pier with a bucket full of shrimp, not for him, for the seagulls. Because Eddie can't go for a week without looking to the sky and saying, thanks. Honestly, that's one of the reasons why we are here tonight, to look up and say thanks to the one who gave his life to rescue ours.
On Good Friday, not only did God demonstrate His love for us by rescuing us, on Good Friday, God liberated us from all sin and shame. See, the Bible often uses word pictures to teach spiritual principles and truths, and, and one of those powerful word pictures about God's desire to free you and me from our sin and shame is found in Leviticus chapter 16. Now, Leviticus 16, let, let's pick it up with verse 7. Aaron must take the two male goats and present them to the Lord at the entrance of the tabernacle. He is to cast sacred lots to determine which goat will be reserved as an offering to the Lord and which will carry the sins of the people to the wilderness. Verse 20, when Aaron has finished purifying the most holy place and the tabernacle and the altar, he must present the live goat. He will lay both his hands on the goat's head and confess over it all the wickedness, rebellion, and sins of the people of Israel. In this way, he will transfer the people's sins to the head of the goat. And then a man, specially chosen for the task, will drive the goat into the wilderness. As the goat goes into the wilderness, it will carry all the people's sins upon itself into a desolate land. Now, 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 don't miss this word picture, it's powerful. Two goats. One was sacrificed on an altar to pay or to atone for the people's sins. But the second goat, the live goat, was driven away, far away. It was used to deal with the people's shame. See, God knew that they needed to be freed from both. And so do we. In fact, Alan Wright puts it like this. He writes, If our sins are paid for by the first goat's blood, but our shame is unhealed, we will always be looking for another goat, another scapegoat. That's why wounded people wound people. That's why ashamed people 
shame people. That's why we need Jesus not only to save us, but also to heal us. Isaiah foretold it. Because we needed a savior, it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer and to make his life a guilt offering, Isaiah 53, 10. Because we needed someone to bear our shame, Isaiah writes, he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. See, Jesus was actually both goats. He was the faultless sacrifice, giving his life for our sins. But he was also the divine scapegoat for our shame. See, he experienced all of God's judgment and he experienced God's abandonment on the cross when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He experienced abandonment and judgment so that you and I will never have to.
Would you thank our singers and band? Would you thank them? Jesus was called a man of sorrows, but it wasn't his sorrows that he was carrying. It was ours. He carried our sorrows and he carried our sins to the cross. See, that's why on a Friday in which such horrible, unspeakable things were done to him, it can be called Good Friday. Or some believe originally it was called God's Friday. Because it was the day that God paid for us in full. And he took all the things that you and I have done, and, and you don't need to raise your hands, but how many of you messed up at least once? <clears throat> Multiple times. I don't know if you have a record, I, I don't mean with the, with the police, I mean everybody's got a record of things that other people have kept and you've kept on yourself, and we're gonna actually talk about some of that on Easter in a couple of, just, just two days away. But what you and I can celebrate is the fact that he took all of our sorrows and all of our sins and all of our failures and all of our guilt and he took it to the cross. In fact, here's what Paul writes in Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 on the screens. In fact, I want you all to read this out loud with me, okay? And out loud means with your voices, okay? We're all going to read it together. God canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. Anybody here glad that God took your record and nailed it to the cross? Mm. Now let me tell you something that's very important. And I don't say this in any way to diminish or put down people that might wear a cross with Jesus on it, but he's not on the cross. He left the cross. But he left our sins on the cross. He left our failures on the cross. He left our suffering and our woundedness and our pain and our humiliation on the cross. And I want to encourage you, I want to encourage you, no matter where you've been, what you may have done, to know that whatever it was, past, present, or future, Jesus carried it to the cross and God took it away, nailing it to that tree so that you and I might be forever forgiven and forever free. That's why this is a good, good Friday. Amen. Yeah. I got a question for you. What do you need to leave at the cross. It's one thing to know that Jesus took our sins and our pain and our suffering to the cross, but the question is, what do you and I need to leave there? He left there. We're to leave our, our sins, our failures, our woundedness. And so here's what we're going to do, because sometimes it helps to do things physically. Worship is meant to involve our singing, our hands, our hearts, our whole body. It's offering ourselves to God. So we're gonna do something tonight, and then we're going to finish with communion in just a couple of moments. And we have three crosses. A third will be brought out in a moment. We have two here now. There'll be three. In the, the little seat caddy right in front of you, you'll see a red card looks like this. And it's got like some white on it. And for just a couple of moments, our, our, our worship team again is going to lead us in some, some beautiful worship songs. And what I want you to take just a moment with it's just to take a moment and reflect on, on, on things in your life that, that you don't want to carry anymore, you don't want to bear anymore, you don't want to remember anymore. You want it to be forgiven and forever gone. Because God nailed it to the cross, now it's time for you and me to leave it there. So I'm going to ask you to take whatever it is. You don't need to write your name. God knows your name. But I'm going to ask you just to take a moment, and you can just write it. It might be a hurt, it might be a wound, it might be a failure, it might be a divorce, it might be a whatever it was, something done to you, something that you might have done to someone else. But it's amazing 
How many of us carry things we were never meant to carry? And so he carried them so we don't have to anymore. Now, I'm gonna give you a little directions how we're gonna do this. Like, how are we gonna do this? And we're gonna do it and be like, like socially responsible with each other. So here's what we're gonna, here's a little video. This is a high-end, high-class video. That is some high-tech stuff right there. But that was row one, and then comes row two. So as we sing, and then in just a moment, I'm going to have you stand, if you're, if you're physically able to, if, you're, if you can't, that's fine, but I'm going to have you stand, because it's easier to, to move. And we're going to start with the first row, and we're going to keep some distance between us. We have some partners in the front that will help us with that. But I'm going to ask you to, to take whatever you write on this piece of paper, whatever you need to leave at the cross. And some of you, you don't even have to think about it. You know exactly what you need to leave there. Others of you, sometimes we, we kind of hide those things even from ourselves. So I'm going to ask you to take a moment and write it down. And we're going to start with the first row. And you just saw it. So everyone in the first row, you are first. And starting on this side, we have three different crosses, three different sections. And you simply walk across in front of it, and you'll take your note, and you'll just, it will stick. And you just place it on the cross, and then you go back to your seat, and we'll just take it a row at a time, and our singers will sing, and we're going to experience what it is to leave it at the cross. All right, would you all stand with me? First row, you're going to start. Keep a little distance between us and our singers are gonna lead us. Yeah. 
The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was brought with the precious
You may be seated. You'll find communion in the seat caddy just right in front of you. And for all of you who are watching online, we invite you to be part of this communion time with us on this good, good Friday. I want to encourage you to receive communion not because we have earned it, because we can't. Paul says none of us can earn God's love or favor, brag about it. It's only by grace that we are saved through faith. And both of those are gifts from God. None of it did we give God. He gave it to us. Whatever we have to give, he first gave to us, and then we have something to give back to him. So we receive communion once again, not because we've earned it or had a really good week. We receive communion because it's God's way of making us right. It's God's way of taking away everything that we did and nailing it to the cross and leaving it there so that you and I can live free and full. So I ask you, there are two tabs. In the first tab, you will pull back. You come to a piece of bread. Those who are watching, you can always push pause and get some bread and get some juice and And it was on the night that Jesus was betrayed that he took bread, and when he had blessed it, he broke it. Would you break the bread with me? He said to his disciples, this bread is my body. It is me, broken for you. As often as you eat this, remember me. It's not about remembering our brokenness. It's about remembering what he paid for our brokenness, that you and I might be not just put back together, but made absolutely whole and brand new. We believe that what God did, he still does, because the Bible says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. And so we read of a healing God who is still a healing God. And he can touch us in every, every area of our life, emotionally, mentally, financially, physically, relationally, we have several in our family of faith that we're praying for, been diagnosed with cancer, other, other challenges they're facing, and liver, lungs, all kinds of issues, and marital issues. And it doesn't matter what your broken place is. Jesus was broken for it. And what you hold in your hand is a receipt for it. Because sometimes you and I, it's just too good to be true. I talked earlier that sometimes for love to be believed and received, it needs to be demonstrated And so you hold a demonstration in your hands of his brokenness for yours. And when we eat this bread together, I believe miraculous things happen, not because this is a magical moment, but because he's a miracle-working God. Father, I thank you for this broken bread. It represents our brokenness. And I thank you that Jesus was pierced, bruised, wounded, humiliated, shamed, so that we might never have to be. I pray for miracles of healing because you're the same God. You're the same God who opened eyes and ears and and brought people back from the dead, and you're the same God at work today in us. And I pray that you would speak life and wholeness and healing. Send your word, it says, and heal their diseases. And your word is Jesus, and the word is wholeness. And we thank you as we eat this bread together in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's eat together as a family. Thank you, Jesus, for giving your body for ours, being broken for our brokenness, that by your stripes we are made whole. Now the second tab you come to is the grape juice. Jesus then took the cup, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood." a commitment that will never be broken. When God makes a promise, he's not only an amazing promise maker, he is the ultimate promise keeper because God cannot lie. Now, I don't know if you've ever had someone tell you, I promise, but they really didn't. Or they couldn't. They meant to, but they couldn't. It's never the case with God. When he makes a promise, he has the power to pull it off, to make it happen. And he promises that if you and I will confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrightness. Not just, not just the penalty part, but the roots of why we do what we do. And he'll help us become brand new creations. And that's what this cup is really all about. So let's take a moment and pray together. Father, I thank you once again 
that all of our sins, failures, charges against us have been nailed to the tree with Jesus. And that when he shed his blood, he was paying his life for our life. And I pray that not a single person in this room or watching online would miss the grace of God. Right now, Lord, we accept and thank you for doing for us what we cannot do for ourselves to make us who we could never be on our own. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Let's drink the cup together. Would you stand with me one more time? And would you give him thanks because you really can't thank God sitting down. So with your hands, with your hearts, would you tell him, Lord, I thank you and I bless you and I praise you for this good, good Friday. Now, Friday was paid day. Saturday was in-between day. Any of you ever have an in-between time in your life? It's, it's not Friday, but it's not yet Sunday. It's that in-between day, and, and, and it's that waiting. Any, anybody hate to wait? Saturday can seem like it's never going to end, but Sunday is coming. And we're going to celebrate Easter Sunday three times, 9, 11, and we've added a 1 o'clock, and especially there'll be more room at 1 o'clock. If you like 1 o'clock, if you like room, that's your service. So we're going to do a 9, uh, 11, and 1, and we have children's stuff. They're having an amazing time as well. So that's going to happen. You are invited. You're invited to bring somebody with you. Now, as you leave tonight, if you want to be part of just the shareholder, part of this family of faith, they're offering buckets, and you can do that. We also give online. That's how we give at Bonita Valley, during, especially during this season. But I just want to thank you for your faithfulness and giving to the one who gave it all for us. And I want to thank you one more time. I want to thank all of our crew, our team, our pastors, our singers, our band. Would you, would you thank all of them with me? Thanks to all of you. And we can't wait to see you Easter Sunday. God bless. See you soon.